second. Hello? Yo, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> awesome. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. We had a little bit of traffic, but I got a new tattoo today, so that was pretty neat. Good. Yeah. Where so are you guys? We are in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Oh, nice. So I'm here with Andrew Turbizi. He's one of our other co-hosts. Hello. Um, I'm actually the person whose phone you're talking on because I'm <laughs> one of the few people that still has a headphone jack on his phone. So. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and then uh, Chris Avello is with us also. He just joined not too long ago. Hello. Nice to talk to awesome. you. Awesome. All right. So let's uh, get started. Everybody, welcome back to Podcast in the Sky with Diamonds. My name is Meg Muse, joined as always by Andrew Turbizi. Hello. And Chris Avello on my right. Hello. And special guest today, Holden Jaffe from uh, Dell Water Gap. Jaffe. Jaffe. Oh, oh great. Stunning. <laughs> Guys, Incredible. damn it. I'm sorry. We're I, saving that. I won't. Yeah, we're going to save it. I won't lie. I did smoke a little bit <laughs> of weed before I came here. Hey, that sounds like an excuse. <laughs> um, it might be a little bit of an excuse, but it's also true. I hear something and then I say another but that's totally cool. Um, so I saw that you recently, Holden, were at the um, South by Southwest Music Festival in Aust- uh, Austin. How did that go? It was great. Um, yeah, it was my first time there. It's a very particular experience, as anyone who's been will tell you. It was um, a lot of friends, a lot of friends who moved to L.A. were there. So it was good to reconnect with people and um, see a lot of them play. Um, it's a bit frattier than I imagined. <laughs> but, you know, they, day drinking and, and all that um oh, i can imagine yeah, it's really inspiring I, I i got back late i guess early this morning around 2 a.m oh, and um been been really inspired been inspired to write it so anything oh. that, that puts me in that headspace is, is positive that's awesome did you see um some other groups that like really kind of struck you yeah i think my favorite show um was japanese breakfast i saw i saw them play a couple times just really really love the pace of the show and 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 she seems like a good person. Um, I saw my friend Sammy play like five times. <laughs> I've seen her. I've seen her. You know, every New York show for mm. the last couple of years. But um, she's she's really a genius and really really inspiring to see her play. Um, yeah, I think those were highlights. Yeah, awesome. How long were you there? Uh, I was there four nights. So I, I came on Wednesday and the festival started Monday. Um, but yeah, I decided not to do a whole week. I thought I'd it turned into a pile of dust. So yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, did you like show any of your new stuff to the fans and whatnot? I know you had played um your new single Chastain at the show that I went to in Alston. Um, but did you play any others that you've come out with since then? Yeah, I played Lead on my arms and and I played the rest of uh the record, which is out next month. Um, the the main showcase I did was for my label, so um, it's inappropriate to play the record plus a few old songs. Um. Yeah, it was nice. I, I played solo, which mm-hmm. is is um is rare for me, but I I, I really love it. Um, good practice, and it's nice to be able to open up a bit and and sort of move at my own pace, um, so I can be a little bit more expressive. But it's also it's also a bit um nerve wracking, you know, not being able to hide behind an arrangement. Oh um, yeah. So it, it definitely always shows me what I need to work on. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I know you did um. I think you close out with Lamplight at the show that I went to and you did it solo as well. And it was um, a lot more intimate, which I think is really nice. And so I. Yeah, also, for sure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I kind of I wanted to ask, like, uh, are there any of your songs that you think, like, in a way, maybe you prefer in that sort of like stripped down acoustic setting? Maybe you think they work a little better like that or anything like that? Or you, maybe you like the feel they get in that environment a little more? It's a good question. I, I don't know if it's a matter of better or worse. It's just. Um... It's just a different flavor, and I think I, as a performer, connect with different parts of a song when I play when I play uh, solo, and I think the audience also connects with different parts of the song when when I perform it that way. I think, in general, I'm I'm less thinking about um, when I'm playing solo. I'm, I I can generally get a little more invested in the song emotionally. I can sort of cater my um, my performance to to really nice feelings surrounding the song and, and sort of bring myself back to when I wrote it um, because because really p- playing in a band obviously part of that uh, being a band leader is is just performing and, and doing my part but it's also carrying the ship you know interacting with them on stage and interacting with the arrangement and um, and yeah it's nice to look turn that off 
sometimes and, and just sort of be the songwriter. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I can definitely uh, see what you're saying there with you being solo. You can kind of get into the song a little deeper and um, emphasize parts of it a little deeper because when you did, I think it was in the yard, was it? Yeah, it was in the yard that you did last. Um, that was, I, you kind of like commanded the audience almost. Every kind, everybody kind of went silent and like you can see that you kind of went to this place that a lot of people don't usually get to see when they see live performing artists because there's so much going on. So we really got to see you like kind of like in the moment in your music and like that was really cool. So I can only imagine what it's like for you being on the inside of that. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, people don't always shut up though. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, once in a while, you know, you get to that moment in the set and everyone's talking and drinking, which is fine too. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, obviously I think part of what we sign up for as performers is, is being passive entertainment and i think that's something that just comes with the with the job but yeah it is, it is really nice when when the room feels to do um in a moment like that. it's a really beautiful feeling and it's less about control and, and i think subdued might be the wrong word because I, I think that does imply control i think it's more it's more about communication you know and having people meet you as far as the tenderness yeah definitely it's uh like I said, it's kind of like captivating and um, it's really engaging because like you kind of bring down these barriers that are usually there with a huge live band and you get to see the artist with their art one on one. Um, and that's always really, really fun to see for me, at least. I like seeing those fun moments. Um, so, yeah, I love those moments, too. Yeah, those um, are really great. Speaking of sort of performing in that solo fashion and, um, you know, maybe going to a different place uh, with a song than you could normally. Are there any that you have found uh, in your solo performances, maybe ones that you've done uh, a number of times that as time has progressed, you've sort of started to perform differently or felt differently about as you were performing them? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I I didn't start performing as a very comfortable vocalist. I think mm -hmm. for a number of years that I, um, I felt like it was a weakness of mine and that I was a mediocre singer and a, and a good writer and I was gonna have to learn my writing <laughs> and I think uh I think I played a lot of shows in the last few years um I've been fortunate enough to play a lot of shows and I've been fortunate enough to practice a lot of those shows and I, I really do feel confident as a vocalist now but um I don't find that I often um take liberties with my own melodies you know I, I pretty much stick to what I wrote and mm -hmm. one thing that I do find is that the more I play something solo the more that um I get comfortable with a vocal melody the more I, I tend to stray from the melody they wrote in a, in a really positive way i think you know yeah. in in a way that makes a, a performance more interesting and um yeah it's it's i think it's the best way to get to get um sort of associated with with a song as i'm as i'm beginning to learn it and and really bring it into my performance um you know and and i, I think there there is a, a big difference between performing a song and playing a song obviously and like it becomes more of a performance every time. And I, I sort of get used to what the arc of it is, where I can open the throttle a little bit, and when I can pull myself in. So, so yeah, that's that happens every time. I get a little more comfortable. That's cool. Yeah, Very exactly. Cool. I can I can certainly see how that happens. Um, so I guess speaking of you know songwritings and whatnot, what was the first song that you ever wrote? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I remember writing songs when I was a little kid. I, and I, I, I don't remember, I don't really remember any of them. I just remember having a notebook and I remember sitting down and, and writing. Um, so I can't give you a specific answer, but that's my memory. I think the first song that I remember writing was a song that I wrote called Clean and Simple that I, I still sort of know. It's a, it's a pretty song. I wrote it about um, what I have since come to um Learn is the friend zone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> being, no. being in love, being in love with a girl who who wanted to be friends with me, and not really understanding why that hurt so much. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote I wrote a song about her, and I actually, you know, I played it forever because I really liked it. And it was really special to me, but it didn't end up ever making it onto a record. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the first song that I wrote that's out is probably Lamplight. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> That's a really good one. I heard that, I heard that when I was maybe 16. And, and that, that um, yeah, that ended up, it came out in probably 2011, mm -hmm. the original version. And then I uh, I rewrote some parts of it and re-recorded it with a producer in New York. And it came out as a single um, probably in 2000, 
13 or 14. Um, so yeah, that's the oldest one that's still floating around. Yeah, that's a great one. I have that one on pretty much all of the playlists that I make just because it's a nice little nice little jam to have on repeat every once in a while. It's really... Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So I was reading through one of your articles that I had found while I was Googling some of your reviews so that we didn't try and ask you the same questions because I always hate when that happens. That the EP that you put out, 646-943-2672, that's an actual phone number that you can call, which is really awesome. And it's kind of seems like it, well, to me, it felt like it was almost uh, music acting as this social experiment where you can kind of connect with your fans in this way after they listen to your music and call you and tell you how they felt or share stories with you. And that's really nice because I feel like it kind of brings you closer to them in a way that isn't really in the music industry right now, as far as I can see, and what some artists may deem as being a little uncomfortable. And I was also reading through um, a book that I got at a secondhand bookstore about some Bob Dylan interviews, and he was kind of trying to do the same thing back in the 60s. I mean, obviously, there weren't any cell phone numbers, but he was trying to get a little more intimate with his fans as well. So it's really fun to see that sort of happening again. Um, is there anything particularly striking that you ever got from any of those uh, messages or anything that you've learned from doing that with some of your work? Yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest takeaway that I got from from the social experiment, which you called it, and which it definitely was, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> was that it was a success. You know, I think oh, yeah. I, I expected people to reach out, but I think that um, I got I got many more communications than I expected, and I got much more consistent communications than I expected. Mm -hmm. I think um, for about the first year, I really did pick up the phone a lot and and kept back a lot. Um, I stopped doing it eventually just because it got a little dizzy and I had a couple of weird experiences. I <laughs> bet. For the most part, people, you know, I think I was shocked that people took the time to reach out, um, you know, because a lot of people, you know, happen across music very immediately and quickly and sort of mm -hmm. this transient way, you know, whether it's through the algorithm or through a playlist. Um, you know, I find a lot of my music discovery. I don't, I don't even really often take a second to look at what the album title is. So I think yeah. I was shocked that a lot of people did find it on the go and still actually took a second out of their data to, to be curious about the phone number and call me and, and leave a message or text me. Um, I think my two favorite stories were one, a kid who called me, I pick up the phone, I go, hello. And he goes, who is this? Say, who are you? You're calling me. Goes, I'm listening to your song right now. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, I hope you like it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, where are you? And he's like, I'm in Nova Scotia. And I was like, oh, it's so cool. Like, that's awesome. what are you guys doing? And it sort of became increasingly clear that whoever this person was, was like very stoned. and was just so shocked <laughs> that there was a human being on the other end of the line. And it made me really happy, you know, because yeah. there was clearly a group of people there. It was like three or four people I could hear in the background being like, oh my God. Um, and then another couple of times radio stations called in, which was very cool. So I was sort of on the air live with people on the phone. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, eventually I stopped picking up the phone just because, yeah, I did a couple of weird experiences and um people who called a few many times yeah. but the, the, the texting has actually been really fun because i i find a lot more people will just send a really kind thoughtful short little note you know mm -hmm. people just sort of you know explaining their that you know a song or the record has been the soundtrack to a breakup or to fall in love or you know to a death in the family or something really intense and once again it's just it's just really nice when um you know you make something in your bedroom and it doesn't feel that special at the time but then you know some months pass and then it, it goes on to really uh you know be a piece of music that accompanies accompanies a significant event to someone and i think just like that as a reminder is is really like the greatest thing as a creator you know because so much of this work is lonely and, yeah. and solitary and uh so just yeah anytime that it's humanized and you know i can be given a reminder that someone else is out there it's it's really nice, and and so it's it's a gift that has continued to, to give back to me. This cool plastic flip phone that I have in my room. <laughs> I love that. It's awesome that it's a flip phone. <laughs> awesome. Um, it's yeah. it's really nice because when I you know first stumbled upon your music, either through some sort of Spotify radio or maybe even it was my Discover Weekly. I'm not sure. Um, I found that I connected to it 
because it's so like incredibly raw and moving and you're like unashamed to show these parts of your soul almost that a lot of artists usually don't do <laughs> honestly because it, it can hurt a little more so it I can definitely see how people can want to reach out to you and and share those moments with you because it's really important for them to be able to tell the people that help them through a situation you know how much they did help them you know yeah yeah I'm, I'm, I'm glad you say that I think um I think I've yeah it's it's part of it's you know as, as I've gone through meeting more people that connected with the music I think that um one thing that I've discovered is that oftentimes people do do meet me and they act like they know me in the best way, you know. Yeah. It's, it's sort of an, an interesting part of being an artist is that um, whether mistakenly or not, like people really do feel like they know you as a person when they may know you musically intimately. And I've I've definitely gone through that with artists, you know, meeting meeting people that I admire and mm-hmm. feeling really comfortable really quickly. Um or even being presumptuous, but I, you know, I luckily haven't had any times when that presumption has been negative. But um, yeah, I, I'm yeah. happy you felt that way. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, one of my favorite lines in my favorite movie, Almost Famous, is like, um, if you ever get lonely, like, go to the record store and visit your friends. So, like, I know <laughs> from from yeah, like a, a more fan perspective, and as someone who just likes to talk and listen to music and be able to sort of break it down to a more raw level like it's just really nice because we do feel super connected to you guys um especially those of us who also make art you know because we want to like swap those ideas and pick your brain and kind of see how we can connect to you so it's really awesome that you're kind of bringing that sort of aspect to music back to life because i feel like it's been lacking more often than not well thank you i'm happy you think so speaking of uh sort of connecting with people and uh, and, and you know what have you um I was reading uh, while I was doing my own research uh, that the album art uh, for your most recent uh, project you found on a subreddit called Old School Cool. (laughs) And there was a fun little story which went along with that, um, which I know you've told before, but I'm interested to know if there's by any chance anything uh, zany uh, (laughs) like that that might be in store for for stuff in the future. Um. I think that uh, I think that 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 was you know it's a it's a wonderful story and I'm so happy um, I came across that picture you know it it, it came it became a really sort of uh, I think special part of the project was, was that story and people being able to talk to that story mm-hmm. um, and I uh, it's rare for me I'm not someone that spends a whole lot of time on Reddit like I've maybe been on Reddit like six times. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I've I've been I've been sort of lucky enough recently to to be uh, confident enough to make my album art myself. Mm. <laughs> so um, I think moving forward, you know, the the album art for the uh, for this next record is a picture of me with a whale that I really love uh, from the Natural History Museum. Oh, um, and then the last couple singles were sort of these postcard style collages that I made. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, I think that sort of the wonderful part of like one of the wonderful parts of living when we do and being an artist right now is that there is so much there is so much room for for finding content you know out online and and often people are really um, open to to letting you borrow it or use it or license it um, and I'm I'm definitely trying to do more of that but also also I'm trying to to I think really start collaborating with some other people um, mm-hmm. consistently, you know, visual artists and producers and everything. And I think part of that will be will be will be uh, will be acting a little more active. Sorry, sorry, being a little more active about um, my aesthetic choices and really working long term with some you know some of my friends and, and people to to put things together. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I think my approach is a little different now, but uh, I'm I'm really. I'm really happy that, that I, I stumbled across that photo. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So what is the um the title for your new project that's going to be coming out? It's called Don't Get Dark. Don't Get Dark. Yeah, that hmm. that's that's a, good, that's a good title. <laughs> yeah, that's uh that's Thank really you. nice. Do you have Shout any on April 12th? Yeah, awesome. April 12th. Ooh, so it's coming really soon. I'm excited. Right, mark your calendars. <laughs> April 12th. Mm. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that uh, new project that's coming out and some of the favorite songs that you have on it? Any moments that were kind of difficult in terms of writing those songs and whatnot? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, 
Yeah, I'm really proud of it. I think it's my favorite music I've put out so far. That's awesome. Um, I really, uh, I really do think it is my my best work for the time that I made it. Um, it's, um, I think it's a little mellower and a little more minimal than some other songs I've put out before. Mm-hmm. It's uh, to me, it really represents the culmination of um, 2017. Honestly, writing wise, I a lot of the songs I wrote in 2017, some of them in 2018, and um, they really represent a very particular time for me, like uh, sort of existentially and romantically. And mm-hmm. um, there were a lot of changes happening in my life, and I, um, yeah, I was really stepping into, you know, becoming an artist full time and discovering a new a new romantic relationship and really making some of the the the, the better friends I've ever had um, and and traveling a lot and. Um, yeah, I mean, the songs are a very sort of specific and focused in narrative. And, and um, yeah, I think my favorite song on the record is a song called Too Philly, mm-hmm. which um, is just a narrative song. It's a, it's a story about falling in love with someone who's uh, from a different city. And they're, uh, <laughs> you know, wondering what's going to happen when they go back yeah. to their city and, and they leave you and, and sort of you know, uh, trying to, trying to, trying to, uh, really sink one's teeth into these, these, like, really, uh, these really fleeting moments that you have with someone when, when there is a, a set, a set beginning and end point for your relationship, you know, and just sort of the, the really, like, beautiful and poetic way in which, you know, you, you can really make yourself remember someone and remember your experiences together as your present, um, I love that song. And then there's another song on the record called Don't Let Me, which I wrote a few years ago. Um, and we, we put out a video for it. There's an acoustic video that came out a few years ago. And I'm really proud of that song, too. I think it's, it's just some of my better writing and the arrangements. It's a bit more mature than a lot of my other music. So I'm excited for, for that to be in the world. Yeah, that's I'm awesome. I'm Yeah, I'm excited to listen yeah. to it. I was I had um, Chastain on repeat. Uh, am I saying that right? Awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. I had it on repeat because I take the public transit around Framingham to get her to work and groceries and whatnot. And it's just like a really nice song to sit and listen to when you're riding around. Um, I found it to be really dreamy and ethereal, and like I was getting images of like the N64 Zelda scenes popping up in my head for whatever reason <laughs> when I was listening to it. So where were you when you wrote that one? Whether it was like mentally physically emotionally was it hard for you to write um just i, I want to hear about it a little bit take it apart for me yeah that was actually the newest one i wrote i think i wrote it like maybe january of 2018 or february mm-hmm. um and i had just been starting to put together my record and i was um sitting at home with my friend gabe who ended up working on a lot of the songs with me and i was having a little bit of a crisis about my voice as a writer and sort of the, just the idea that, that a lot of my songs seem to be um, felt to me in that moment, very one dimensional, which obviously I, I don't believe that. But in the moment, I think I had grown a little bit tired of singing about romance or singing about relationships or singing about like loneliness or any of these things that I've been writing about for, for a number of years. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he said something really funny. He said, you know, you don't, you don't really write about yourself. You don't really write about your perspective. You don't really write about any of these other things that you talk to me and all of your friends about, you know, whether it's um, feeling a bit, feeling a bit like depressive or feeling a bit um, nihilistic or cynical. So I decided to, to, to write a song that was more about sort of the experience of a person just moving through life and less about, you know, feelings from other person. So yeah, I, I sat there and I wrote the song, and um, to me, you know, it still is a narrative song, it's still a story song, but it's, mm-hmm. to me, it's much visually more about, you know, the image of of a life like not led, right? You know, someone that's just sort of sitting in their apartment and mm-hmm. just sort of obsessed with nostalgia, and 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 you know, the, in in the song, the character of the writer, you know, there's a lot about taking sessions on my lunch break, you know, which is you know, as sort of an ode to to a lot of the, you know, the the sort of pop writing world. You know, you take sessions and you fit in the more you can in between your job mm-hmm. <laughs> that pays for your rent. And um <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then and then verse two goes on to talk about um 
shame, you know, and, and, and being ashamed of one's past and feeling disconnected from one's childhood and from their family. And then, um, and talks about death, you know, and, and, and not wanting to be a ghost, you know, wanting when life ends, wanting it to end, you know, sort of wanting a clean end whenever it happens. Yeah. Not necessarily wanting to die, but wanting it to be finite, you know, in this life, mm-hmm. everything is so unknown and, and very, very little is finite, you know, and, um, and then the outro of the song is sort of uh, a positive resolution in which the narrator talks about, you know, despite all of this, and despite you know, my cynical feelings, my nihilistic feelings, like as an artist, I have, I have found moments of peace and, and uh, alignment in, in writing um, and in being a writer. So I think it, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a sad nihilistic song, but it ends on a really positive note. Well, you say that it's like a sad nihilistic song, but I also think that it's definitely a song that almost everybody can relate to. I think we've all been at that point right. where we feel stuck and we don't know where to go and we're like obsessed with this nostalgia because like that's the only form of the happiness we can give ourselves right now, however little it may be. And um, then we're ashamed of ourselves for it because we don't know how to move forward and it's always easier to stay in the dark versus like trying to fight through it. So, I mean, I definitely found it was very easily relatable. And it just had this beautiful uh, accompaniment to it as well, which was really nice. I think it kind of makes it a little easier to listen to, not like emotionally anyway, because it's not necessarily things people want to hear, but what they need to hear and how they're feeling. So you're kind of like giving that experience uh, a voice where people can relate to it. Thank you. I'm glad you think so. Yeah, <laughs> of I course. Think, uh, that's, I like that about it, too. I, I think it felt a little more relatable than, than some of the other music. Yeah. And, you know, the other music you put out, all the like your love songs are so beautiful and eloquent. Um, but it's always really nice for writers to kind of start bearing, bearing their soul a little bit and be like, OK, like, let's get down to the nitty gritty of what it all is and what it all means. And um, it definitely gives a different doorway for fans to open up and connect with music on a deeper level and not just what's the next greatest pop song on the radio. Like, what's the song you listen to? when you need a little bit of a pick me up sort of thing, like genuinely. Yeah. I yeah, I agree. I, I, I've also, I've really wanted to write a song that's about writing for mm-hmm. a while, you know, something that's sort of self-aware, a narrator that is a writer in the song. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, I think that, that also makes, makes that one special in particular. To me. Yeah, definitely. So do you have any songs that you've written that were like, especially hard for you to write, whether it's like, it was hard for you to get those words onto paper or it was just like really hard in terms of finishing it. Because when I write, sometimes you want to finish like a short story or a poem and you want it to happen so hard, but like the more you try to write it, the less it comes to you. And um, uh, I just wanted to know if you have any that, that were sort of like that, that you're really proud of. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like I think the better question is, have any songs not been hard to write? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a good one too. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe two or three. It's, I'm I'm not someone that, that has lightning strike moments very often. Mm. Um, when I was a kid, and when I first started really writing, like I would write maybe three songs a year because I I felt very strongly that I should only write when I'm inspired to write. And I would sit around waiting for something exciting to happen, and then I'd write a song about it. But you know, the odds weren't very high often. So right. Like, it wasn't <laughs> always that exciting. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, and I met a few. Uh, Few other writers my age, you know, like in the New York, and started meeting a lot of songwriters. I realized that you, you can treat this thing a little bit more like a practice or like a job. And yeah, definitely. And um, you know that being creative, one way, one way to be creative is, or one way to look at creativity is to make yourself available to it as much as possible. You know, sort of opening yourself up to it by showing up every day and sitting down with an instrument or a piece of paper and a pen, and then if you're lucky. Once in a while, um, something good will come out. <laughs> you know, yeah, every you know maybe every five songs you'll get one that's like really good. But yeah. if, you, if if you sit around and wait for it, you're probably not gonna catch. You know, you're gonna miss a lot. You know, like <laughs> a lot of those songs are floating around up there. So um, yeah, I mean, I I write a lot, and I think writing is still sort of my strength as an artist. But mm. it's it's incredibly hard for me, and it's. Uh, Admittedly, it's not not always a very enjoyable process. I mean, even today, you know, I'm just getting back into like reading every day. Cause mm-hmm. My record's done, and it's hard. I mean, it's it's a lot of sitting and being patient and yes. being calm mm-hmm. and putting your phone away. 
you know, and not playing the same chords that you've played every every time. And like, yeah, exactly. Trying to break down some boundaries and really trying not to gaslight yourself into, you know, because I think a lot of people have a very loud critical voice. I know I do too. But it's, mm-hmm. You know, that voice just tells you, like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Like, you'll never write another song again, you know, and, and that's something that I really struggle with. So finishing for me is very hard. I have a lot of half-finished songs, um, but um, I, 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 do, I do really try to push myself to finish. And often I'll find that if 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 I, if I fight long enough, if I can wrestle a song to the ground, like, I, I'm really happy that I put in the time. Um, I think specifically just from... The new record that's coming out is a song called Theory of Emotion. Mm-hmm. And I had the verses forever. And I, I wrote maybe three or four different choruses for it. And none of them felt good. But I love the verses so much. So I couldn't, I just couldn't let it die. I couldn't say like, no, nah, I'll just set this one out. Because the verses felt so strong and poignant. Mm-hmm. And I, I wrote chorus after chorus after chorus. And then one day, I, you know, I, I was on a date with someone. I was really miss my ex-girlfriend and I came in mm-hmm. I was a little bit drunk and I just sat down on the gas and I picked up my guitar and I started playing a chorus and it was the chorus. It was perfect. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I mean, that was a lightning strike moment, but yeah. it, it, once again, it only happened spontaneously like that because I had been looking for it right. day after day after day. Um, so yeah, I find writing very hard and I, I know it's not true for everyone, but oh, um, no. it's, 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 it's been a game of, of effort for me and really like digging, digging, digging to unlock thing within me um and i think a lot of it is about taking care of oneself creatively you know i i feel strongly that my writing changes when i'm reading when mm-hmm. i'm seeing films when i'm spending time with creative people or other artists you know i it really helps my writing if i'm if i'm consuming words yeah i uh can definitely relate to everything you just said and i had so many thoughts so uh, i might seem a <laughs> little scatterbrained for a second because i want to address all of it so for me, I very rarely have lightning strike moments. And when they do happen, it's kind of like I go into like this weird trance. And if I don't get it down onto paper, I'm going to lose it forever. Or like I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll write something and I won't remember that it's there until a few days later. But I think what's so hard about like forcing yourself to, well, not necessarily forcing yourself, but wanting to kind of just like sit there and focus and like really write on something is it's scary because you kind of like delving into your subconscious a little bit and like thinking about all these tiny moments that happened and some of them are great and some of them are not but like they're all kind of like this fuel for like the fire that like is songwriting or poetry writing or short stories because like as much um we like we write from life almost so it's kind of scary to kind of take that apart and put it into words that you don't even really know how you feel about it so it's kind of a way for you to like process things and I know for me that can be really scary sometimes, but it's also like such a relief when you can get all of that out onto paper and you can look at it and you'll be like, okay, that's how I felt. Now I can let it go. And I know for me, I've like thrown out a bunch of work that I thought was not the greatest, but each one was like a stepping stone. So like, you know, every five songs you have a good one. So like you're kind of working towards what you want to say a little bit, like they're, they're drafts and so I definitely get what you're saying about that. And you said you're starting to start reading again every day, which is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I mean, I used to read a lot in high school. I would devour like four books a week and I want to start getting into it again. So what books have you been picking up lately that are kind of sparking your attention? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, um, I'm right now I'm reading a book of short stories by George Saunders. Nice. Um, <laughs> Very nice. It's been really wonderful. It's sort of um, bizarre, dark humor. Um, it's it's nice because I, when I first started writing songs, I was reading a lot of Kurt Vonnegut and <laughs> Bukowski and a lot of this sort of like dark, scary, uh, once again, nihilistic writing. And so I think that really informed a lot of my writing early on. And it's funny to be reading. Saunders is a, is a bit lighter. Like he's he's a little bit more impressionistic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm reading him right now. And it's, it's been nice. I haven't like laughed out loud at a book in a while. Yeah. So that's really... It's a great feeling though. I'm pretty... <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, I actually. I, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say it's uh, actually funny that you should mention it. Um, just yesterday, um, Meg and I had had traveled out to uh, Northampton, out by uh, UMass Amherst, and um, went to a, a, a secondhand bookstore, and I actually uh, bought Slaughterhouse Five so I could reread it. Um, oh, amazing! It's been a long time, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I, I came across uh, you having said that. Uh, Vonnegut had had been an influence of yours, and I was like, "Oh, well, shit!" But not twenty four <laughs> hours uh, prior. Uh, so yeah, something I wanted to talk about. Well, I'm really excited for you. You're in for a trip. I'd read as much Vonnegut as you can. Like, it's 
it's funny how that his books, a lot of them connect. There's a lot of sort of overlapping characters and themes. And mm. um, yeah, I, I I I hope you enjoy it. You know, he's he's, he's a real legend. Um, I'm sure I will. Yeah, but um, what else? I'm reading Bruce Springsteen's autobiography. I'm not mm-hmm. a huge Springsteen fan, admittedly. Like I think a lot of my friends would crucify me for for saying that on the record. Oh, but, no. um, <laughs> I'm still I'm still trying to. Um, I'm still really trying to fall in love with this music. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a couple of years I've been trying it. I love the record in Nebraska, but I haven't, I haven't really found my place in the other music. But um, I got his book, and I thought that might help inspire me to, to listen to the music more. And I've been really enjoying it. I think I think he's I think we're we're a bit like minded. <laughs> uh, he's uh, he's got a good head about music and writing, mm-hmm. and it's been, been about the process. He just has this real like head down fucking move mentality you know like yeah. nothing's gonna stop me like i to keep going and to keep going and to keep going and, and um he he talks a lot about how his parents you know are, are from sort of more traditional backgrounds like his, I think his dad wanted him to his mom wanted him to be a children's book author his dad wanted him to be a I can't remember a mechanic or something because <laughs> like, like, i think oh i think one of my uh one of my struggles has been trying to explain to my parents what I do and that I, you know, I do work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I, you know, that I am, I am, you know, I do have a career. So I, that, that was, uh, that was a funny uh, part of it that I really connected with. Um, what else am I reading? I just, uh, I just bought a bunch of books. I, I finished a book by Rebecca Summer that I talked about in another interview called Feel Dead, uh, Feel Dead for Getting Lost, mm-hmm. which is really, really, really wonderful. Sort of more like it's sort of an exploration. And, um, it's, I guess you could call it auto fiction. You know, it's sort of autobiographical, but embellished. Oh, I love books um, like that. Some of my favorite novels are like that. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's sort of reminded me a lot. I, I just, I love this book that, that a lot of my friends have read called Bluettes by a writer named Maggie Nelson. And she, uh, it's sort of, it's sort of in that vein. It's a bit existential, but it's, it's narrative and it's autobiographical. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, sort of half poetry, half prose. So I, I always find that that type of writing very inspiring. Oh, um, well, if you as like, as much as Saunders, you know, Saunders or Ronnie that sort of like ground me and let me laugh, like the more existential stuff, I think is also really productive and and puts me in a different headspace. Have you um have you read any James Joyce? I don't think I have. Oh goodness, what should I read? I um. My favorite book is James Joyce, and Chris just bought it yesterday, too, while we were at that secondhand bookstore, and I did my entire senior thesis on it in college, um, and it's his autobiographical novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Um, oh, I have that. I have that. Yeah, I just haven't read it. You, oh my gosh, I like tore it apart. I love it. it. It's so fun the way it starts out, because it's like a stream of consciousness sort of narrative. It's like it starts out when he's like really young, like three or four and like that stream of consciousness. And it shows like how um, the literature develops, how like uh, his mind would develop. So he becomes more written, uh, well-written in the later chapters. And it's all about his struggles between like how his parents want him to live and religion and how he is and how he wants to live and how he wants to be an artist. And it's just this incredibly beautiful um, ballad, almost an autobiographical ballad. And um, I completely fell in love with it. So if you like, books like that i would highly recommend that you you try digging your teeth into that one yeah i definitely will i think i will yeah i need to finish george saunders but when i do i will make that my next book yeah um portrait is is a phenomenal novel i think you would like it and then you have to let me know what you think of it because like i said i did a whole 29 page thesis on it so <laughs> i love talking I will. about Thank it you yeah for the recommendation absolutely not a problem hemingway too he does a lot of um Really good autobiographical, <laughs> autobiographical novels like the Nick Adams yeah, stories. Yeah, I read some Sun Also Rises. I read. Oh, Sun Also Rises is a really good one. Um, and then his collection of short stories, the Nick Adams stories, is all about how he grew up in, um, the Midwest and whatever. And that was really cool to read, also. So, that's another recommendation: is the Nick Adams stories by Ernest Hemingway. And that's, um, that's what I'll leave you with. You'll have to let me know what you think. Okay, I got I got my uh, got my books cut out for me now. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. no, they're awesome reads. Oh, reading them, they're they're definitely easy to kind of just sit down and and really go through because they're very captivating. So I think you'll very much enjoy them. Great. Um, so I kind of had a question, like somewhat along like a somewhat similar vein to like which books you're reading to inspire you. I would kind of like to know as someone who 
listens to a lot more music than he reads admittedly <laughs> i think it's because i'm also something of a musician like i would like to know like what sort of like music you're listening to like right now or have been listening to have been you have been listening to that's the phrase that you found like really <laughs> inspiring that you want to like that has made you want to write or made you want to like write a song or write a lick or keep working on a song or something yeah yeah it's 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 funny because i i definitely have uh i have a complicated relationship with with music being that i spend all my time making it fair so i i've i've really gone through a lot of periods of time of, of physically not being able to listen to music like anything even close to pop music because um because you're just like you know, surrounded I'll, I'll, by the music so much you just need to like escape I a little am, bit yeah yeah, and I think it, you know, it. unfortunately, you know, if I spend like eight hours, you know, working on a production or writing or working on a mix, it's like the last thing I want to do is listen to more music. Um, and I think emotionally too, um, you know, it's it, it can be a little distracting to listen to music. I think I think for a lot of people listening to listening to the music that you want to make is is a positive thing. For me, listening to the music that I want to make is a negative thing. I think it. It causes Same. me to to not actually make original work, and I think it causes me to second guess myself, and and uh, it's, it really does slow me down. But um, more recently, I've actually been listening to a lot more music, which has been really nice. So I've been I was just last night listening to um, this Antonio Carlos Jobim record with Astro Gilberto. It's a really beautiful record. Mm -hmm. It has like girls making them on it, and a lot of like really beautiful Boston Nova standards. Um, listening to a lot of Pine Grove. Oh yes. I, I sort of am just getting into their new record. I love that. I was Pine a big Grove. fan of Cardinal, so I've been yeah, sort of discovering that. Um the other day a friend of mine showed me this record by a guy named Bill Callahan called Sometimes I Wish We Were an Eagle. It's a really beautiful record. It's sort of you know, it's sort of structured a bit like the stuff that I make, but it's it's sort of weird and eccentric enough that it feels uh, <laughs> it feels clean. So I've been really loving that record. Um I just met this kid at South by named Briston Maroney, who's a wonderful guy and a wonderful artist. Um, I saw him play a great show. I've been sort of hearing about his music for a number a number of months, but um I'm listening to to his record. Um and then probably the last record that's been really in rotation is this record called Hub called Hasono House by uh an artist named I think it's pronounced Hiromi Hasono. He's a he's a composer. He I found him because he did the soundtrack for uh, Shoplifters, <laughs> which um, I believe won the Best Foreign Film Oscar this year. Oh, nice. Um, and he, yeah, he's a composer, Japanese composer, who was in a band called Yellow Light Orchestra, I think. That's Yellow Mag familiar. Magic Orchestra, I can't remember. But he um, he's put out some, some solo records, and I think this record is from the 70s. And it's oh, it a really wonderful record. Electric Light Orchestra, if it's from... I don't think he's electric light orchestra. Yeah, I don't I think know he's yellow. How many light orchestras are there? I'm not I'm unsure. <laughs> it might be yellow magic orchestra. There's a lot of orchestras. Let me look them up real quick. Fact, I'm awesome. Fact I'm, a, I'm doing a dive right now. He is too. Love it. Production cast. You guys keep talking. I'm going to look. I'll find it. <laughs> Music by this guy. Okay. Um, while, I guess while he's... Uh, taking a look at that yellow magic orchestra it's called yellow oh, okay. magic orchestra yep. found it yeah that's what he's right he inspired genres such as city pop and something as a leader <laughs> of yellow magic light orchestra according to like the first paragraph of this guy's wikipedia page nice there, there, yellow magic right, there orchestra. we go Awesome. Well, there you go. There are more rock orchestras than I thought there were previously. I guess so. <laughs> but that's cool. Um but yeah, he's brilliant and his music is very like palate cleansing for me. It's mm -hmm. just really it's really beautiful arrangements and the composition's beautiful. And honestly, having lyrics in Japanese is just like very refreshing to me. <laughs> just to have something that I can't necessarily understand. You know, I think foreign language uh, music can be a bit more emotional, you know, because yeah. you really are just left to the. Yeah, you're left a lot more to, interpret like, the, uh, to like the actual sound versus maybe getting lost exactly. in the lyrics. Very cool. That's exactly. awesome. I'm about that. Um, so yeah, listen to Hasano House. It's a great record. Got to have to. But I'll put it on my queue for the ride home. <laughs> um, I was going to yeah. ask um, in in the intermediary, but but now now here I am on the spot. Uh, <laughs> on the spot. I was going to ask if there were any any genres of music or just music in general um, that you enjoy that you haven't 
ever found yourself incorporating as an influence in um, any of your work? I think it's hard to say because, you know, just harkening back to the sort of you are what you eat sentiment with art, I think that probably naturally a lot of what I consume gets in even passively. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I've i spent a lot of time at the opera in, in New York. My grandma used to work at the opera, um, I think in the 90s. So she she gets a lot of t like free opera tickets. So <laughs> I'll go a couple times a month. And so I, I consume a lot of opera music. And to me, that is similarly like separate enough from my work that I feel very sort of relaxed and comfortable in that setting. And mm. I, I would assume that once again, like melodically, some of it has gotten in, but I think uh, it's probably the, the farthest from, from what I do. Yeah, that is cool. That is cool indeed. So you, like I've mentioned, I was at one of your latest shows in uh, Great Scott in Alston. So you did like kind of a small local tour. Um, were there any particularly good moments from those shows uh, or stories that really um, have stuck with you over the past few weeks? Yeah. Um, I think my favorite moment of that tour was um, in Philly. We played, I think, the night after Boston. Mm. And um, it was great. We had a good room. It was on Valentine's Day, actually, so two nights after. We had a good room. Awesome. And, um, yeah, the crowd was really lively. It was wonderful. And about half of you just said someone requested a song called I Am Drunk and She Is Insane, which mm. is sort of yes. an older song of mine that we don't really play live. And I said, oh, we don't know. I'm sorry. We can't do that. And we were all laughing. Mm -hmm. And then... People kept saying the name of the song, kept saying it, kept saying it. And sort of as a joke, I started playing the chords. I haven't, I haven't played the song in years, and I just sort of was miming the chords trying to remember how the song went and began singing the first verse when I could remember <laughs> and uh, was, was stumbling through it. And before I knew it, the whole room was just leading me through this song and singing it as I played the chords. And we got through the entire song. And the band eventually kicked in. There's a big outro section, and everyone dropped in and playing the whole song. And it was such a special moment you know, wow. it, was, it was one of the, one of my favorite moments performing i've just never i've never really been led like that and just just knowing that everyone there knew a piece of my work that i didn't know as well <laughs> it was really humble <laughs> that is really awesome I, I think i'll just remember that forever yeah it was that's really remarkable. special yeah that's uh that's absolutely beautiful. I'm very glad that that happened to you, um, honestly. Speaking of live shows, I want, um, you know, I'm going to have to uh, come, come and see you live at some point, but I have to know before I commit, uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, songs that you may or may not perform uh, live, do you uh, regularly perform Rockman's Pier? Yes. Because there's something about the trumpets that just <laughs> does it for me. <laughs> No, I think, I honestly don't think I've played that song in three or four years. Oh, that hurts me? It <laughs> I, hurts me? I'll come? I love it hurts that me. Song. Yeah, I can't lie to you. I think that, yeah, I just, we, we went through a couple sort of periods of, of uh, you know, sort of shifting creatively. And I think that was mm. unfortunately one of the ones that got left behind. But I, I'd like to bring it back. You know, I still like the song a lot. I think it's good. And um, people do bring it up a lot. Um I tweeted it at yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I have a lot of music. I have a lot of music, and most of my sets are like an hour. So, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, I didn't really get to play everything. And, you know, there's a lot of new music that I want to play. But, um, yeah, you know, I think, I think, I, you know, as, as I tour more, I do want to incorporate some of the older music. Because, um, yeah, I mean, as I'm meeting more people, I'm realizing that, that there are people that really do connect with some of those older songs, even if I don't. And I think it's worth, like, re-examining them as I've gotten further from them. So. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of songs, I really love Rockman's Pier, but I also um, really, really love In the Yard. I listen to it. It's like one of my favorite warm, rainy day songs um, when I just need like this nice, genuine reminder when, you know, things get a little blue. Um, is that song about anybody in particular or what was it like writing it or, you know, what were you going through? Yeah, um, that I really, 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 I was such a, a poignant, strong memory of writing that song. I was in high school, I was finishing my senior year of high school, and I, I went to a boarding school, so I was in my dorm. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I was really into this girl. We, it was, she was pretty much my first girlfriend, and she, uh, was a, she is a wonderful musician, great songwriter, great vocalist, guitar player, and she was the first, um, she was the first person I really had my life that I felt this level of like healthy competition with where I really looked up to her and I really wanted to impress her. Awesome. She pushed me to write and I, I loved her music and I still do. I still listen to her record. Um, and 
and we had been fighting a bit. We had a bit of a falling through, and you know, being 17 or however old I was, I, you know, I didn't really know how to communicate with her, so I decided to write a song. And um, we we had this joke um, about how she, how she was always leeching on me, you know, and how I was always leeching on her. It was sort of this, this sort of mutually codependent relationship. Right. And um, and so I just I took I took that sort of joke that we had and I turned it into a song and the song is sort of a vignette about um, some of the experiences that we had and you know a, a real feeling of like closeness and and fear you know being that I was leaving and she was staying and um, I remember playing it for her I don't think she really liked it and I was so sort of crestfallen because I really wanted her to like it <laughs> but then I ended up playing it for the whole school and, and, and that that sort of a talent show and that became the first time I ever sang in public really you know in front of an audience was playing wow. that song in front of my high school you know there's 400 people there maybe and I was so nervous but I got through the song and I played it and people were like oh that's a cool song and then you know I, I ended up putting it out on the first Ola Gap release and you know it did reasonably well considering I dumped it online I got you know got some blogs and I got some play um, and it's you know it's still uh, still a song I play yeah live and it's still a song that people talk about and you know even just in Austin I was playing a show stopped by and someone requested it and I played it and it's just like it you know I, I I don't think about it most of the time but you know when I do actually take a second and think about think about it you know it's it's really stunning how songs can have a life you know they can really really have a life of their yeah. own you know it I guess at this point I, I wrote that song like eight years ago or nine years ago, you know? Wow. And so it's like, it's just crazy to think that it's still floating out there and I'm still playing it. And, you know, if I'd known that when I was 17, like I just would have been so in disbelief, you know? Um, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it just makes me want to keep going, keep writing music. Cause like, who knows, you know, stuff can really, can really walk, walk far. Absolutely. I mean, I know it was one of my favorites right off the bat. Um, that one, Lamplight, Rockman's Pier. They're all great <laughs> in their own right. And they all have such yeah. different vibes, but they're awesome. Um, I also saw that people have asked you why Del Water Gap as the name for you. And uh, you said you actually added it to a list of band names that you had. So what were a few of the other ones that you were debating between? <laughs> um, well, the, the one that I remember, uh, there was maybe 10 on there. The only one that I remember is the worst band name I've ever come up with, but I really considered using it for some reason. I'm so happy. I didn't. <laughs> um, and that name was Kids Who Play in Igloos. Oh my God. <laughs> what the- and I, th- there was, there was seriously a point in time when I, I thought I was going to use that. I kind of like um, it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's by no means like a bad band No, name. I kind of like but it actually. To me, I, maybe I just related to that <laughs> version of myself at that age, but I, I'm just so happy I didn't commit to that. Um, I think the image is very like Nintendo to me. I don't know. Mm, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but yeah, that was the other. and then you know I really thought about just using my name like S Old Jaffe and like I still I still think that I should do a project with my name. Um, you know I think it takes a different level of courage. I was just talking to my friend about that. You know I have a, I have a friend who's a solo artist and she uh, she was talking about that. You know when 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 the feeling of putting out music under your you know given name for the first time is is really it's really terrifying in a way that putting out music as a band is not you know yeah definitely it's really irreversibly like getting this thing away um so i'd like to do that you know i'd really like to to put out a whole jack record at some point but yeah, but great. um I'm, yeah I'm, I'm still using that what i got for now I, I i still like the name i still feel connected to it and i think i think uh it's aged with me so yeah no it's yeah, great I'm, and it's I'm, certainly... I'm happy with it well yeah. if you uh i think that if you ever uh, in in your travels as an artist, do you ever decide that you want to try some real synth heavy? <laughs> I think kids who play in igloos yeah. is the way to go. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> yeah or absolutely. maybe just make that the name of your weird like electronic music experiment album with the band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always space for that. <laughs> there's always space for more experimental bands. So. Um, yeah, I'm not worried. So that's okay. Let's see what else we got. So that that was good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I know that little tidbit of Del Water Gap trivia now. That's awesome. Um, so <laughs> what was your it's all happening moment? Like when did you realize like, okay, I'm in this. I'm a musician. I'm gonna make music. I'm gonna make it. Like when when did that sort of click for you? When did that happen? You know, I 
I don't, I don't know if I've had that moment. Um, okay. I think that, uh, I think that very few people have that moment. I think a lot of people think they have that moment, but I think that sort of contra the reality of 99% of people's artistic lives and careers. Um, I think that what I've been given are a number of small moments that have been nudges, you know? Um, okay. I think that um, a few of those moments have been, I sold out a, a show in New York, my biggest show in New York, which was like about a year ago. And that was definitely inspiring. That was a big moment for me. Mm-hmm. I think uh, signing my record deals was, was, was that moment in a way. I think that, um, you know, even just this tour recently, the, the reactions that I got in those rooms were, were all nudges and moments. I think that um, having musicians that I really admire and look up to telling me that they know my music and like my music, that's, you know, those have been big moments. But I think that uh, looking for, for that moment sort of implies an arrival point. And I think, I think once again, it's, it's rare. I think most, most people in this field don't actually ever have an arrival point. If anyone, you know, like mm. Beyonce, <laughs> I, I think that you, you know, even my most successful friends, you know, who are doing at huge shows and, and, and making plenty of money and playing on TV, like you're still fighting in a way, you know, even if you're not fighting to make an income or even if you're not fighting to have people hear your music, like you're fighting to challenge yourself as an artist and, and be prolific and breathe and be healthy and, and, and innovate and um i think that uh i have i have a long way to go before before i even will feel like i'm approaching that moment i think but i i think i think that um i think that i i need i need a, i need a nudge every like two weeks I think about, <laughs> like every two just about every two weeks i need something to happen whether it's yeah. like a great show or a really good meeting or just write a really good song or, even, you know, even some people send me mail, like that's really inspiring when I get a package from, from some stranger. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's a collection that I'm trying to build and continue to build and, and look at when I need it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's that's a really good answer. <laughs> I love that answer. Uh, so what would you say is the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? Best advice I've ever gotten? Um, I think the best advice that I've ever gotten was... From Benny Blanco, I met him a couple of years ago, and he. I asked him if he had any, you know, regrets about his career. You mm-hmm. know, anything that he would have done differently. Because obviously, he's immensely successful. Right. He said um, something to the to the extent of, you know, he wishes he had been more present just as things were starting to work, because I think there's this there's this phenomenon that some people call like the pipeline. Some people call it like pre-fame. <laughs> Yeah. a lot of words for it but it's this this moment in a lot of people's careers that they talk about when it's like just before things really start happening you know when maybe you're sitting on that record that blows up or you know you're you're you know you're about to to go on that tour that ends up changing everything or you're you know you're you haven't yet met that you know that producer that ends up making the record with you and people talk a lot about that that period of time being the best time yeah. because all you have is your blind confidence <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and your work that you believe is genius because you haven't shown it to anyone and your friends love it and maybe your team loves it and um you know what i took away from what he said was just to like be present you know when things are happening and mm-hmm. when you when you are achieving these goals or even when you're suffering you know just like tr- try to sit with it and be with it and be present because yeah. like you can never get that back you can never get the moments of like feeling like you're making it back like even, even what we were just talking about you know like these moments i've had on tour these moments that like you know these really transcendent performances that I felt like I've had or, you know, these moments that I've, I've been writing and I've been really connected. Mm-hmm. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've really tried to practice that. just like being present and appreciating that any of it is working. Um, you know, I think so few people really get even 10 minutes of their entire life and they feel as like connected and fulfilled as one can as an artist if, if it's working. Yeah, definitely. Um, That's great. <laughs> um, I had seen, uh, talking about trying to sort of be present and, uh, you know, in the moment, um, I had read that you said that I believe it was in college you started uh, journaling every day. Um, and I just recently, uh, in the past few months, uh, started journaling only on a weekly basis. Um, and actually, I've not been great about that even. Um, but, 
what what do you how do you do you always have something to write about i i find myself struggling necessarily to always have something that i think is worth noting down um mm. uh necessarily but i i don't know if maybe uh you know do you yeah. reflect what do you you know i don't always have something to write about but i think i think it sort of harkens back to the you know the earlier part of our conversation about songwriting you know mm. how it's always hard like i think that i i was able to learn that about songwriting through journaling. Um, I, I had a I had a professor in college, a songwriting teacher named Mike, who um, he had us write every day. He had to do object writing, which is a practice where you choose an object, like anything, mm -hmm. an inanimate object, you know, uh, chapstick, let's say, and then you set a timer for five minutes, and you just you have to write for five minutes about chapstick, and you, you're not allowed to stop until you finish. And um, you know, the next day you choose something. You know, street lamp. <laughs> you, write about how you can write anything. You can write about how you have nothing to say about it, or you can write out how it's gray. You can write about how you know, as a kid, you used to hang off this, you know, the street lamp in your in your hometown. Whatever it can be, anything. But the goal is just to write, just to like put pen to paper and fill pages. And, and uh, the the point of this practice is that you know, like songwriting, like like when you you force yourself to sit down and be available and open yourself up to the possibility of writing. Often, yes, it's it's hard and it's boring and that five minutes feels like two hours and you have nothing to say and you're just writing random bullshit that feels pointless. But oftentimes you find that our sort of accidentally you start writing something sort of profound. <laughs> and um, so to me, it's, it always began with the practice. You know, I say like, I need to journal every day. Like it doesn't matter what it's about. So, you know, I'll, I'll sit down and, and once in a while, like I'll have something pleasant to say. And once in a while, I'll have something profound to say. But a lot of the times it's more or less the same, you know, it's, yeah, it's like sunny out. I'm a little bit hungover. <laughs> There's my dog. Oh. Um, I have a meeting today. And, yeah. you know, I, I feel better than I did last week. Yeah, I feel worse than I did two weeks ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to stay positive. And maybe this is what I'm listening to. I'm like, mm. yeah, I mean, I think, I think if you go, if you really try to put the process first and you try to realize that, like, if the practice of writing every day is important to you or weekly, then, like, you can force yourself to do it you know if it's like going to the gym you know if you say like i need to get exercise every day to feel okay like you're just gonna do it you know yeah. and that's it, it obviously doesn't work for everyone you know it, you know it doesn't work for everyone but it, it, it's it's what's worked for me I, but I, I think i'm also like particularly type a about a lot of this stuff um <laughs> i sort of have, have struggled with it being a little bit too like rigid but um mm. yeah i uh i absolutely get that i i'm it, I, I'm a big procrastinator. I mean, plenty of people are, but the only way I can ever get myself to do anything is if I open my eyes and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm doing this now because <laughs> mm -hmm. otherwise Absolutely. it ain't happening. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm the same way. I mean, once again, like I, I'm trying to write another record right now and I, I, I sat down this morning and I, I, I had to like write down on a piece of paper, like, okay, I will write, you know, X amount of songs a week. Mm. I'm going to put that over my desk and I'm just going to fucking do it. <laughs> if I don't do that, then it just doesn't get done, you know? It's just, I'll come up with every excuse in the world to not yep. do it, mm -hmm. you know? Which is crazy because it's writing like it shouldn't feel like work, but it is, you know, it really is work. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every, yeah. Everything feels like work sometimes, that's for sure. No, it's true, <laughs> it's true. So uh, just a few more questions, some offhanded ones. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Good question. I mm. think if I could live anywhere in the world, I would live in New York City. <laughs> I think I'd live in the West Village. I think I'd live in the West Village in like a really nice townhouse. Ooh, that does um, sound nice. That does but sound if nice. I could have like a second home somewhere where I didn't have to live all the time, I think I'd want to live in a town called Sedisfjordur in Iceland. I think it's in Northern Iceland. But don't quote me on that. Well, you can't quote me on that because we're literally recording. But, um, <laughs> but um, I love Iceland. I spent a lot of time there. That's awesome. I, I worked there for I worked there for about three or four months, and then I've done a couple of trips back. And it's just such a beautiful place, and it's so inspiring to me for some reason. And I, I've only been there in this. Oh, I have. I've actually been there in the winter, but I, I spent most of my time there in the summer. And there was just you know it was like twenty two hours of daylight a day, and I, I just. I've never been more prolific than when I was there. I think it was a lot to do with the daylight because I would start working at like 6 p.m. and just go till 11, 12, 1 a.m. You know, because wow. whatever that thing, you know, the human brain, it starts shutting down like it's dark, it just didn't turn on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would just keep going and keep going and keep going and, and writing and writing. And I wrote some of my favorite songs I've ever written there. That's awesome. Um, 
Um, How about to travel more though? I haven't traveled enough within the U.S. I really want to do the Northwest and the Southwest. And, oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Me too. I need to do more. America's so huge and it's so beautiful, it's and there's so huge. there's it's like so, huge. so much to see, and, <laughs> and I feel like we're a big I'm, ass country. I'm never gonna have the time to see it, but I want to see it so bad. Like I just want to drive around and get into all like the little nooks and crannies that I can find. So. I want to I want to go to yeah. the cool places, but I want to go to like. Gary, Indiana, too. Like, I want to yeah. go to the, just the places that nobody actually wants to see. But <laughs> God damn knows it, about. I'm going to go there. I'm going to support them. Is Gary, Indiana a real town? Oh, it is. It's, and apparently it is. it's not very yeah, good. I'm so with you. <laughs> um, okay, what um, is your favorite childhood memory? Oh, also a good question. Um, my favorite childhood memory is for my fifth birthday. Nice. I was wearing this little sort of sailor style overall. <laughs> Hell Robert, yeah. I guess. The word for it now. Um, that sounds adorable. I definitely had one of those. I, it was just the first moment. I mean, obviously, I, I grew up in a great house. My parents have always been really great playing, but it's the first time I really remember being like the center of attention and being like <laughs> felt, feeling really special. Oh. You know, and, you know, I it's I just remember like really being with a lot of friends and we had a we had a clown there at the party. And I remember just sort of being like the center of the show you know for the clown like i was sort of the participant and all the tricks and mm -hmm. and i remember opening my presents and everyone just being really like loving and supporting me and being really excited for me and then the best part was my mom my mom um is a really accomplished baker she's a wonderful cook and a wonderful baker and she made me a a train cake you know that had like nine cars oh wow nice. every every one of the train cars was like covered and you know, candy and frosting and all this stuff. And I, I remember distinctly her giving me the front of the train <laughs> and just being so proud of it. And like it had marshmallow wheels and oh, such a wonderful, like train. an awesome like, cake. I love trains. Yeah, I man, would love I, a train. My fifth birthday was amazing. Yeah. And I was obsessed with trains. And I, I still am. I love trains. I have dreams about trains. All the time. Hell yeah. Trains are awesome. <laughs> I, I actually fall asleep every night to train like ambient train noise. So that's dope. I yeah, have a trains are big for me. I have a train. I have like a few trains actually um, that run right behind my apartment in framing. Oh, nice. Yes, yeah, so that's really cool. I hear the trains all the time. And last night I heard it and I literally yelled out loud. I was like, it's the train. So everybody else that was in the apartment uh, knew about it. And I have friends that like send me videos of when they see trains. <laughs> it's just, it's. One of, yeah, one of the <laughs> favorite. Are you referring to a specific person? Because I feel like you are. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I thought. There are very few specific friends of mine that just love to feed my obsession it's with trains. The train. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm glad you like trains. Yeah, I really feel strongly about trains. So. I um, I would them. love to do one of those like cross country train rides that are only like 117 dollars and just like Meg, just do it for yeah. free and hop in the back of a random freight train and hope getting, for the best. Get in the caboose. There you go. <laughs> you might get arrested if you do that. But actually, oh, yeah, yeah, you will. One of the foliage can. trains. Yes. Maybe trains that just have like glass ceilings. It, you went from New York to Montreal and that is, that's that's turn crime foliage whenever that is in October. And it's wow. Incredible. It's even like about to retire. You want to find yourself. <laughs> yeah, that um, that's cool. They have like a tequila train in Mexico too now that just like takes you all around Mexico and gives yeah, you a bunch my, of tequila to try. That's my favorite try. Jimmy Buffett album. How did you know? <laughs> I don't know if it's a Jimmy Buffett album, but <laughs> very well say could probably. Be. Sounds like <laughs> it sounds like it could be a Jimmy Buffett album. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so do you have any other artistic outlets other than writing music? And I guess reading, because we just found out that you've been trying to get into reading as well. I um, I love uh, I love coloring. Nice, dude. Oh, yeah. I have a bunch of coloring books. Same. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I love that. I really, really love coloring. It really calms me down. I do feel creative. Um, I use children's coloring books. So I don't use, yeah, the, the adult ones are way too hard. Um, mm. So I like I like children's coloring books. I really like to draw more. I love taking photos. I take photos all the time. I like I shoot four or five rolls rolls a month. I just take a lot of photos of my friends and like when mm -hmm. I travel, I take photos. And, um, my like personal Instagram is sort of dedicated to my photos. That's awesome. Um, and uh, I'd love to like do that more seriously i don't know if i have like the time to right now but mm -hmm. eventually i'd really like to you know invest in some more cameras and like maybe take a class or not you know i also think the best way to learn how to do art is just to do it so mm. like i've gotten a lot better as i've just taken more photos but mm. um yeah i don't know I'd, I'd, I'd like to draw i'd like to write a book someday yeah definitely um i don't know if i have the patience yet but I think I think I will someday. I mean, most most novelists take years 
to write their books, yeah. um, if not decades. And it's usually not until they're in their late thirties, early forties. So I think we have some yeah. time to go, friend. <laughs> we, we haven't have lived time. enough life. I think that's all there is to it. Um, so what's the first album that you ever listened to that really kind of caught your eye? First album uh, was the Smash Mouth self-titled record. Nice. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> My good word. My good I love it. <laughs> Which, if you listen to the self-titled record, it, it has no hits on it. It does not have all-star, does not have any of the ones that anyone knows on it. Oh, man, you're like um, the OG Smash Mouth. Those, those yeah, and it, Smash Mouth. I remember buying the CD. I was in Walmart with my dad, and I, for some reason, I saw the CD, and I was like, I either heard of them or like, I just like the album cover. But I remember asking my dad to buy it for me, and he bought me the CD. And I had a little Walkman at the time, and I just like, I I played this CD over and over and over and over again. I loved it, and yeah, I can still sing every word of the record. Oh and I, that's awesome. I um. I just really started re-listening to it for the first time in literally like, you know, in literally like 20 years. Like the other day, <laughs> I, I started listening to it again a couple, right before tour, actually. I started, so in like January, I was listening to it. And it really stands up. You know, I obviously have like a personal connection with it, but it's a really sort of thoughtful, dark record. Like I think at the time, I didn't realize how sort of sad a lot of the topics are. Yeah. It's, you know, it's Smash Mouth. It's like very bubble gum and like it's like Sugar Ray. You know, mm-hmm. it's like very sort of you know bright arrangements but a lot of the like lyrical content is really dark like you know there's this there's a bridge in one of the songs called holiday in my head and holiday in my head the whole song is sort of about like not being able to afford to take a real vacation and sort of being too depressed to go on vacation oh, and so you have to just sort of like imagine it and the whole bridge is about how he's like overweight he doesn't he can't afford to eat healthy food and like all this stuff that I missed when I was like a five year old, <laughs> and listening back, I'm like, this is fucking crazy. Like this is really <laughs> dark. Oh like, a lot of it's really beautiful and profound, and there's some really nice love songs on there. And, like the production is amazing. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's really like dated production. It's like really like 90s, early 2000s, like super compressed, like huge mm-hmm. guitars and like, oh, yeah. weird blip noises. But it's 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 a really good record and yeah that was the first one i bought and i you know i i have like the now cds around that time too my parents nice. used to buy me those but so I, I i knew singles a lot but uh smash mouth was the first like album i really got into and then after that i got into the justin timberlake like solo record jt or justified nice. i think it was called yeah, yeah something like and that. then there's a jason mraz record which i believe was his first record called uh i think it's called curbside profit I like really I, great record. I liked um, early Jason Mraz. He was really good. Yeah, really beautiful stuff. It's like very like rappy and yeah. And then there was a, a Matchbox Twenty record that I bought. I can't remember <laughs> which one that was, but it was really good. Also, I really loved it. And, and then the first like real band I got into after Smash Mouth was uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. They were like my shit when I was a kid. I loved them and nice. I sort of got their like drums. I, I played drums for like ten years, and, and mm. that band like really inspired me to play drums. So. That's awesome. Very cool. Okay, so what was your favorite? What well, I guess was and is uh, your favorite animated movie? Uh, Princess Mononoke, I think. Interesting. Really film. You can't go wrong with I, I ha- Ghibli very stuff, good. But... Yeah, it's like I'm. I saw that on on um, VHS, like maybe when I was like ten or eleven. I just remember being so blown away by it because it's really like sort of scary and like Dolly esque. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. and nightmares but it's beautiful and i hadn't um i hadn't seen any other like miyazaki films i never saw spirited away or any of them mm-hmm. i had only seen princess mononoke okay, recently i saw spirited away mm-hmm. really loved it but um yeah i i, st- I still love princess mononoke okay, i'll see it in a couple of years um yeah awesome that's that's dope all right andrew want to give our last question yeah so our last one so like if you could work on a project an album a single anything musical with like any artist living dead anything like that like no holds <laughs> barred Ex- who would it be existing in limbo um it'd be my grandfather david he passed away when i was 14 mm-hmm. um he was a really wonderful accomplished clarinetist and composer wow mm-hmm. had a beautiful long career and um I, I have some really wonderful memories of him when I was a kid and he got he got sick when I was maybe like eight or nine and he he sort of uh lost his personality, you know, he lost like the version of him that I knew. Mm-hmm. Um but I have the most distinct memories, even when he was getting sick, he would still play clarinet and I just have like 
most vivid memories of walking to his apartment. He lived in New York City um, and just hearing the clarinet and playing for me and singing for me. And I, you know, as I've become more of a musician and as I've gotten further into the industry, like I really, I really missed him. You know, he, I, I really sort of wish that he would be here because I don't have a whole lot of artists in my family and I don't have a whole lot of musicians in my family. And mm-hmm. he, he was also a record executive. He also ran oh, wow. Columbia Masterworks for a number of years. So oh, wow. he really, he was a really wonderful, smart, sort of charismatic, artistic man, like an entrepreneur and an artist in a way that, you know, I I am you know, an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and an artist. And, yeah, so and um, yeah, I, I just, I've, I've always really sort of wished that I could have shared, shared more music with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I dream about him and I have a lot of uh, really nice memories of him. And oh, my grandma, his, his, his wife is so very much alive and present. And we talk a lot about him. And, um, she's the one that takes me to the opera. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. And she's a filmmaker. So That's I, have, awesome. I have some, artistic family with her too um wow yeah well that's um that's that's beautiful yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) honestly um i'm sure wherever he may be he's definitely listening to you and he's absolutely proud of you that's Dude, sure. I think he's a DWG fan. I think he's got to be. Oh, he has to be. <laughs> <laughs> you put out some really incredible stuff. So I just want to thank you so much for for staying on and chatting with us for what an hour yeah, and a course. half. It says we're recording. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Great That's what it says on my phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like we try. <laughs> we try and come up with <laughs> questions. That's why we do the research beforehand, so we're not asking the same things that everybody else does a billion times. Yeah, over. that's smart. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Over. Your questions were great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you. You th- your answers were great. Yeah, your um, answers were like very thought provoking. It was very cool to like, get some like very oh, personal great. like insight into you as an artist absolutely you know, like i can read inter- happy. yeah it's like you know i can read interviews and listen to your music all day but it's like you know when you actually hear it from the horse's mouth it puts a whole <laughs> new like perspective on it yeah yeah I, i'm glad you think so yeah I'm, I, I really you know it, it takes a good question to give it a good answer so absolutely absolutely well we've exactly. got some really great stuff to work with um definitely uh let us know how your reading goes <laughs> um, and let yeah, us will. know, I will. let us know when you're coming back around. I, I mean, I follow you on Instagram and, and uh, Twitter yeah. and whatnot. So I'll definitely keep an eye out for when you're touring next. Cause I would love to see some of your new stuff live. Um, and for everybody yeah. out there listening, keep an eye out for it. April yeah. 12th, April 12th, April 12th, April 12th, Mark April your 12th. Don't get dark. You heard it here <laughs> first. Maybe. April 12th. Yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming it'll be streaming everywhere that you get your music. Apple, it'll Spotify. be everywhere. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and you thank you again so it. much for for chatting with us. Maybe we'll be very grateful to have you on again uh, soon once you get some some more stuff out there, so we can ask you some more great questions. But until then, we hope you have a very wonderful evening. Yes. Um, thank you. We will talk to you soon. It's been a pleasure. Right, great. So it was awesome to talk to you. Have a great night. Yeah. We'll be in touch. Bye, guys. Absolutely. Right, bye. Bye. bye.